Welcome everybody. I'm Delia Clark and I'm a place-based education consultant working with the Iditarod Historic Trail Alliance in partnership with the Chugach National Forest, BLM Campbell Creek Science Center, and the Anchorage Park Foundation. In normal years, we offer the Iditarod Trail to Every Classroom program, which we call iTrek, as an 11-day in-person teacher professional learning program spread across a year. iTrek encourages teachers to think about how they can connect to place, bring their students outside more, bring outside resources into the classroom, and how they can connect with the Iditarod Trail and the cultural and natural landscapes of Alaska. During the pandemic, we are offering some of the core elements of iTrek as a webinar series called Take It Outside to, con to, take it outside to continue to serve Alaskan educators in ways that we hope are valuable to you. We hope you're able to use the information you get today to encourage your students to get outside and learn more about the nature and culture of Alaska. We'll be offering this series throughout the rest of the school year and we hope you're able to attend more sessions and we also have uh, the past sessions recorded so you're able to access those as well. If you're interested in receiving a flyer listing the full series, or if you'd like to learn more about the recordings, please contact us at itrekalaska at gmail.com. So that's I-T-R-E-C Alaska at gmail.com. Uh, now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Olivia Frankie. Uh, Olivia is the Conversation Programs Coordinator for the Alaska Humanities Forum, and at the time she wrote the guide she'll be talking about tonight, she was a resource assistant for the U.S. Forest Service. We're really excited to have her back with us. Uh, Olivia, it's all yours. Thanks, Delia. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining today. Um, so today, the session is all about the Iditarod National Historic Trail Educator Resource Guide. So I'll be sharing my screen in a moment, and we'll be going through a deep dive. Hopefully, hopefully folks got access to the PDF of this document as well, in case you want to follow along on your own. Um, so I do currently work for the Alaska Humanities Forum, but my background is in environmental ed and place-based service learning. So really excited to be revisiting this uh, guide and kind of going over it for folks. So let me get my screen share working here. Um, okay, so hopefully that looks good to folks. Can I maybe get like a thumbs up? reaction. Okay, perfect. So um, here's the guide. I'm going to just go over it. Um, a lot of this information is actually covered in more depth in previous sessions that have been recorded um, and are available to rewatch those. So I won't go too deep, but definitely want to give an overview of um, what is all included in this guide and how to use it um, and set folks up for success. Um, so this guide uh, provides multiple different sections in here. I'm gonna go over the first four of them um, and we won't do too much of a deep dive into checkpoint five, um, but some of this um, is kind of more interesting if you dive into it on your own. So we'll go ahead and start with checkpoint one. What is the educator resource guide here on page six? So the educator resource guide was developed with three main goals in mind. The first one is to empower educators to use place-based service learning techniques to teach about the Iditarod National Historic Trail. Um, we definitely wanted to provide some accurate historical understanding of the Iditarod National Historic Trail. The history is uh, very rich and as we work with um, teachers across the state, just making sure that that uh, history and that story that we're sharing with students is, um, is all accurate. So definitely providing a lot of that information. And then the last one is um, that this guide will support other education, interpretation, and professional development opportunities. So um, very specifically for the iTrek program, um, if that, you know, when that comes back um, and it's kind of in-person uh, dynamic, uh, this guide will be really helpful. And then it's also a super helpful resource, especially now as we're doing virtual training opportunities. So um, hopefully this guide will kind of uh, just bolster a lot of the information that has already been covered in the sessions this year. Um, the guide is designed for all educators, whether formal educators in a classroom or educators in um, uh, agencies or in communities, whatever that looks like, this uh, guide can be tailored to 
tons of different scenarios for, for teachers. Um, we did really wanna make sure that the lesson plans that are included are aligned to Alaska state standards that teachers are expected um, to meet. And so lessons either align to next generation science standards or common core standards. So um, lessons can be implemented um, in classrooms and still uh, achieve the standards that you're hoping to achieve. Um, so this guide is as comprehensive as it can be, but there's tons of more information out there that is available. Um, so I definitely encourage folks to think about this as um, a resource that allows you to deep dive uh, or identify topics that you would then like to deep dive into even more on your own. Um, we, let's see, let's see, yeah. Um, so that is the background to the guide, the goals of the guide, and kind of who this guide is for. The next checkpoint is going to talk about the background information um, for the Iditarod National Historic Trail. And this information, as I mentioned, was really deeply covered in a previous session with Kevin Keeler, who is uh, works for the Bureau of Land Management as the trail administrator. So I won't go too deep into the background information. Um, I do want to note that this information is presented in multiple different um, kind of methods. And um, a lot of that is just because there's so much information to cover, definitely wanting to break it up into different uh, ways of presenting that information. And then also potentially model some of the different ways that this information could be presented to students. Um, so we'll go ahead and start going into the background. Um, this kind of just talks about overall uh, what the trail is about. It's a 2300 mile network of trails that's been designated as a National Historic Trail within the National Trail System Act of 1968. Um, it has not always existed as the complete long distance trail that it is today or systems of trails as it is today. Um, for thousands of years before European settlers arrived in Alaska, uh, Native Alaskans had used routes that would later become part of this trail system. Um, so one thing that I do uh, wanna pause here and kind of recognize that's uh, recognized on the next page as well is that, um, the lands that the Iditarod National Trail kind of goes through um, are native Alaskan lands and a lot of parts of this history and this story um, aren't coming from me as, as the writer and developer of this guide. And so um, for more of that rich history, um, those should come from different native agencies and organizations across the state. So there are parts of the story that definitely need to be a deeper, deeper, div dove into, I guess, um, with, uh, with other communities. So definitely wanting to recognize that. Um, and then also recognizing, as I've kind of mentioned already, that the entire history of the INHT could not possibly fit within this guide. And so um, using this background section as a starting point to identify um, different sections of the history or the background that are particularly interesting. Um, and then using this as a, just a touch point and then deep diving into that, um, doing some research. So there's tons of resources at the end of this guide that, uh, that we'll, I'll kind of touch on at the end of the session here. And that those are gonna be great resources to deep dive into topics that you find interesting. So the first way that the background information is presented is in a classic timeline. Um, so timeline will give you an overview of the major events that are associated with the trail. And um, as I already mentioned uh, here, just starting that for thousands of years, Alaska natives, including coastal Yupik, Inupiaq and inland Athabascan peoples used travel routes that have now been incorporated into the trail system. Um, so the use, existed time immemorial and then also will continue um, on as communities today still use parts of the trail as travel routes between communities. Um, so I don't, I don't want to read word for word every date on here. We've got um, early history starting uh, in kind of 1843 with Russian fur traders and then we kind of go into some of the history around gold being discovered near Hope and Sunrise on the Kenai Peninsula, um, and then the history of the Alaska Central Railway, Railway excuse me, um, uh, in 1903. 
Uh, something important to kind of note is that Seward was selected as the start of the railroad um, because of its location as a port. Um, so lots of other kind of areas were, were considered as the start of the railroad, but um, Seward's access to year-round ice-free port, its deep waters, and then of course the proximity to the Kenai Peninsula made it so that it was the best choice for the, for the start of the railroad. Um, going into the next couple pages, we're kind of in early 1900s, um, and then on Christmas Day in 1908, gold was found um, in a tributary of the Iditarod River, and this discovery started one of the last great gold rushes, and then of course um, kind of led to the, uh, the start of the long uh, range Iditarod Trail. Um, Trying to think of what important ideas here to, to pull out. Um, there's lots of development early on right after the uh, gold was found in December 1908, but then um, the other kind of noticeable change comes when um, the railroad gets completed and uh, airplanes start becoming uh, popular for mail delivery. The trail then starts to um, decline in use um, in the early 1920s. Um, so there's lots of kind of factors that lead to this declining. Um, and so this is a really interesting kind of trajectory to deep dive into uh, when you have time. Uh, the other really notable date here that I'll point out is winter of 1925, um, really highlighting the serum run that happened. Um, it is associated with the history of the uh, INHT, but the route that was taken is um, definitely different than the routes that are associated with the system today. Um, so the serum was transported from Anchorage to Nanana versus uh, via railroad. And then dog sled teams transported the serum um, in a relay back to Nome. Um, so really important history. This is some of the information that um, you know can get a little convoluted with the history of the trail, but still closely tied to these communities um, and, and really interesting to deep dive into. Um, then the, let's see, after that, there's kind of a gap, um, but the, as the trail continued to fall into disuse and, and was abandoned. But then um, in the mid 20th century, uh, the trail started picking back up um, with the establishment of the national trail system in 1968. So then what kind of led to the Iditarod race being formed um, was a hope to kind of commemorate sled dog racing as an important feature of Alaskan history, as well as the gold rush history, and then also um, gain recognition for the system trail to be recognized as a national historic trail. Um, so as that kind of picked up, the first Iditarod sled dog race uh, was in 1970. And about five years later is when the trail was officially designated as the National Historic Trail. Um, so again, I've, I've mentioned uh, several times it's a system of trails because there's different routes and um, it's not just one point to an end point. There's, um, yeah, a network of, of trails. Um, Something important to note here too is that the Bureau of Land Management was designated as the trail administrator. So for every National Historic Trail, there's a trail administrator. The role of the trail administrator is to coordinate amongst the many agencies and entities that are connected to the trail. Um, and then later on in 1998, the, or the Iditarod Historic Trail Alliance was formed. And so um, there is an associated nonprofit organization for each of the National Historic Trails. And so for the Iditarod, it is the Historic Trail Alliance. Um, the Historic Trail Alliance is the uh, nonprofit organization that hosts the ITREC program in partnership with the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management and independent contractors and Anchorage Park Foundation, um, who are all partners also on this Take It Outside series. So that's kind of the connection there. Um, another kind of exciting thing that I'll point out is in 2010, the first class of ITREC teachers received their year long training. Um, and then 
Most importantly is that you all will continue the story of the Iditarod National Historic Trail. Um, history doesn't just exist in textbooks. We are all part of the story um, today. And so as teachers and students are learning about the National Historic Trail and, and sharing its story, we all become a really fundamental part of that story as well. So I know that was really quick overview of this background section. Um, what I wanted to do was give folks, oh, that was the timeline. Um, so I'll even more quickly go over um, some of these other pieces. These next pages here on pages 18 and 19 are some distinctions between the Iditarod National Historic Trail and the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race. So that's a, a pretty important distinction to make while they're really closely tied, um, they are, two different uh, kind of things uh, in, in Alaska. So um, we've broken it down there. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to break down was important trail features. So this section goes over tripods, uh, roadhouses and safety cabins and digs into a little bit of the history of these three trail features that are, are, that are pretty common um, along the Iditarod National Historic Trail. The next piece of uh, kind of section of the background is um, highlighting some big names of the Iditarod. So past, present, and future um, characters along this story that, that really made a big difference in, in the history. So um, for the establishment of the trail, this kind of dives deep into Walter Goodwin and Huhiro Wada. Um, there's a section about folks that were really fundamental for the gold rush and serum run, uh, Alaska Nelly and Leonard Seppala. Um, definitely names that are pretty common here in Alaska. Then we've got folks that were really fundamental for the recognition of the Iditarod as a national historic trail. So we've got Joe Reddington Sr. and Dorothy Page. Um, one thing that really stuck out to me as I was doing research and developing this section is that um, the folks that are associated with this uh, with this rich history and are super important to the development of what we now know as the INHT um, are men and women and immigrants and people of color. And so that is um, just really important to note, something that I uh, was hoping could definitely be pulled out and highlighted for students as teachers kind of go through this section of of important names of the Iditarod. Um, so yeah, uh, the other features of the background section, we've got a frequently asked questions page. This is um, pretty interesting to read through. Um, questions like what is a national historic trail? Is it a trail or a race? Um, how long is it? What's so special about it? So definitely deep, uh, dig into these things. Um, I'm trying to think, I think that most of this has already been covered in more detail, but it's a, a quick fact sheet for you. Um, this one was one of my favorite things to put together was the um, trivia section. So just fun pieces of trivia information about the both the INHT and the sled dog race. Um, so uh, one of my favorite uh, little tidbits of information was that there was never a gold robbery along the Iditarod Trail, even at the peak of the gold rush days. Um, so that is just kind of a fun trivia fact there. And we've got uh, um, several more. The last part of this background section is talking about the important partners to the trail. Um, so as I mentioned, the Bureau of Land Management is the trail administrator um, and they work to coordinate the efforts of lots of different agencies and landowners and entities that are tied to the INHT. Um, so we've named just, um, just a few of them, the Bureau of Land Management. I mentioned the nonprofit that's associated with um, the INHT is the Iditarod Historic Trail Alliance. The Chugach National Forest is an important partner as well as the Fish and Wildlife Service, Alaska State Department of Natural Resources and countless Alaskan community partners. Um, many communities have volunteer organizations called Trailblazers, and there's just far too many to name. Um, definitely encourage teachers to look into um, what volunteer organizations might exist in the communities that you are teaching in, um, as those folks dedicate a lot of time to kind of sustaining and maintaining the INHT. So um, these are important partners. 
at this point, I did want to um, take a quick break and give folks about five minutes. What I would love um, for us to do is to look through just section two, just the background section, and find one piece of information that you did not already know before today. And that might be challenging if you have already watched or attended the introduction to the INHT with Kevin Keeler, but maybe hopefully there's one piece of information in there that you can pull out. So uh, we'll do about five minutes um, of our own time to look through the educator resource guide. And so that means that I will start back up at 427. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started again with uh, the next section. But like I mentioned, once you have a um, fact or a piece of information that you didn't already know, go ahead and plug it into the chat um, and we'll continue on. Let me see if I can get back to screen sharing. Okay. Hopefully that is showing the screen that I want it to. So we're gonna move on to checkpoint three, which um, goes over place-based service learning. Um, so this is another section that there is a really in-depth um, session on that Delia led. Um, so this will just be a really quick overview. I'm actually gonna to try to go a little bit faster over this section. Um, so one quote that I really love um, that is related to place-based service learning is do what you have to do in the classroom, but then get outside where you belong. And that is from Dan Seavey, who's a longtime steward resident, um, a teacher and um, a musher. Um, so place-based service learning in, there's lots of different ways to kind of view what place-based service learning is for, for our context and the way that we approach place-based service learning, we've got five bullet points here on this page. Um, let's see, this is page 32. Um, so place-based service learning is integrated with community opportunities. It's based in real and authentic experiences. It implements mutually beneficial, dynamic and empowering partnerships. Um, it definitely involves high degrees of collaboration um, but most importantly, fundamentally, it meets and facilitates outcomes-based and standards-based academic goals. So again, one of the goals of the guide is really to support classroom teachers in, um, in the, the standards that you're already trying to meet and address in your, in your learning. So place-based service learning should be a boost and a bonus to your teaching style, but not a distraction. So you're still able to accomplish what you need to. Um, we uh, think that, uh, let's see, it's accomplished by implementing meaningful service and facilitating the mutually beneficial partnerships. Um, and it offers experiences that can transform students' perception of standard classroom concepts while addressing really authentic community-specific needs and opportunities. Um, so you hear me talk a lot about community uh, opportunities as a part of creating a place-based service learning unit. Um, and so what I mean by that is just finding something in a community near you and your students um, that is a potential for either presenting solutions or collaborating on a project, implementing something in a community setting. Um, and so that opportunity is really kind of the source of, of inspiration for a place-based service learning project. Um, so there's lots more information in here. Um, Delia went over the six principles of place-based service learning that are uh, on thir page 33. So those are grounded in place, place-based service learning experiences are based in place. Um, and uh, very often that really means physical or geographic place. Um, the way that I've always talked about and learned about place-based service learning though, is that place also involves the mental and emotional stage of your students. And so really recognizing that, um, you know, third grade students are probably too young to be learning about 
things across the globe, um, but really should be focused on things closer into their classroom or schoolyard. And then as students um, kind of advance, uh, they can then expand what place means to them, whether it's their community or their state or um, their country that can kind of expand as students uh, advance. So place is both geographic and emotional and mental for students. Um, Place-based service learning, the second principle is that it's real. And so that involves that um, community uh, opportunity portion where those needs are authentic and that they're collaborative and um, really addressing some sort of opportunity in a community. Um, the process is empowering to students. This one's also referred to as student voice. And so providing students opportunities to either make decisions or um, really be empowered to guide what their experience looks like, um, present, presenting students with choices, things like that. Um, the next principle is that it's collaborative. So to in order to address and be rooted in real and authentic community opportunities, um, really robust collaboration is needed between teachers and community members. Um, often teachers and teachers will collaborate, whether that's cross grades or cross subjects um, that will really kind of bolster a PBSL unit. Um, PBSL units should be integrated um, so that they are a part of the learning process and not necessarily a separate unit or a separate experience. Um, so they're integrated into the standards that um, you're needing to reach and then also integrated I think about having like multidisciplinary and multiple topics um, as as the world works. Um, topics are not generally separated and so having um, a really integrated holistic uh, project is uh, is fundamental to a place-based service learning unit. Um, and then the last one is rigorous and so um, Having students really think critically and comparatively, the learner is centered in the PBSL experience. Um, and so it can, um, yeah, just be a really rigorous process where um, students and teachers and facilitators are challenged throughout of it. So these are the six principles. Um, and uh, yeah, just wanting to present those a little bit. The next little bit of information is um, part of this, um, teaching triangle. Uh, I forget what I formally called this, but there's kind of three tiers um, that I think about when going outside with students. And so I wanted to present these in these three levels for teachers who may be new to taking your students outside, um, whether it's your first time um, or you've done it forever. Some of these tips um, can be super helpful. So I separated them into a base tier level of safety. So these should be things that will help ensure that all of your students and that you and any co-facilitators or co-instructors are being safe. The next tier will be comfort. And so once you start getting more comfortable, these are the things that can help you and your students um, kind of just advance that comfort while you're out in the field. And then the last tier, I've named it Thrive, uh, not to say that nobody would be thriving in either of these safety or comfort levels, but once you're really comfortable with teaching outside, you've done it a lot, these are kind of the above and beyond tactics that you can use for um, student management outside. Um, I won't go into these um, too much in depth, but there's at least three per tier. So I'll pull out one of them. Um, one of my favorites for safety is boundaries. And um, just there are so many unique ways to making sure that boundaries are clear for you and your students and that students um, uh, are able and feel empowered to follow, um, yeah, follow those boundaries. Um, this is a great place um, to practice that empowerment um, principle um, to kind of engage your students in setting those boundaries and maintaining those boundaries as a group, um, especially if you are returning to a one place multiple times throughout the school year, that will become easier and easier. So boundaries are going to be really important. Um, for the comfort level, uh, one thing that I definitely just pull out is teaching in circles. Um, teaching in circles is a great way to make sure that all students um, can have their attention on the instructor, um, making sure that the instructor is a part of the circle though, rather than standing in the middle, will also kind of ensure that um, 
you can see all of your students and all of them can see you and whatever materials you might be holding up. Um, Related to circles um, in the Thrive section, one of my um, things that I like to think about once I'm really comfortable with a space or with a group of students is where I'm placing myself and my students in that space. And so things like going above and beyond and thinking about where is the sun uh, in this space? Ideally, the instructor would be the one to kind of sacrifice and look towards the sun so that students aren't being distracted by like, oh, I can't see the materials. Um, so where you place yourself in a space will kind of also um, influence how successful that time in that space is. So that's the one that I'll pull out from Thrive is placement. But there's lots of other tips and tricks in here um, relating to kind of managing students and managing your learning time while you are outside. So definitely dig into some of these as a part of this section as well, I wanted to highlight and provide um, so many different resources that have been super helpful for me in my journey of teaching outside and facilitating. Um, so a lot of these are professional development programs across the country, sister programs to the Iditarod Trail to Every Classroom or iTrek. Um, across the country. And then I've also got a list of books and online resources that that uh, just have been yeah, really supportive and definitely highly recommend checking these out if you want to dig more into kind of the philosophy and pedagogy of place-based service learning. Um, you can check these out. So that's super quick for place-based service learning. I do want to provide another um, quick break in this section with another prompt. Um, so the prompt that I want you to think about is to think about a lesson that you are already teaching, whether you've taught it for 10 years or you've taught it once this year, something that you're already comfortable with that you're teaching. And uh, refer to page 33. Um, in that lesson, in that lesson that you're already teaching, what principles are present? So I know that was a lot of words to say, basically take a lesson that you're comfortable with that you teach and think about what principles you're already meeting in the way that you are teaching it now. Um, so I'll give us, we'll do a shorter one this time. We'll do four minutes um, and come back at 4.45. And again, page 33 will be the important page for this break. All right, we'll go ahead and take one more moment to think about a principle or principles that exist in a lesson that you already teach. Um, in the chat, we've got that um, in most of someone's experience uh, with environmental education, collaboration is a huge component of any good lesson. Um, I love collaboration. The more folks that students can interact with, I find that it's more likely that students will be able to connect with an educator or connect with the topic. Um, so I love that one. And then also in the chat, um, one project for a persuasive writing unit is change makers. Students identify a real problem in the school, city or community, um, and then are empowered to propose a solution and they collaborate. Wow, this is a lot of them. This is all of them. Wow, they collaborate with other classmates to have a similar theme in their projects. Um, it's integrated into multiple topics and it makes it very rigorous, totally. That's amazing, yeah, that's a great example. So we're already using these principles in the teaching and, and units that we're having our students go through. So sounds like we're pretty familiar, which is exciting. Um, so that's gonna be it for the place-based service learning unit or uh, section. The next section of the educator resource guide is the resources to start putting it all together. So we have the background historical information. We have this information about the pedagogical approach of place-based service learning. And then for this next section, um, I developed some resources that can help start planning and then implementing. So uh, in this last section, there is um, a 
framework for how to design service learning from community opportunity. Um, there's lots of ways that this can look. This is just one um, kind of way that made sense in my brain. And, and if it helps other folks think about how to go through this process with students, then that is what I was hoping for. Um, this section though, before I start going into um, more of this information, this section is really where you can take bits and pieces and customize it to your students to your teaching scenario, whether you're in a classroom or if you work for an agency and you teach outside all of the time, whatever that looks like, these, resource, these resources in this section are really malleable and designed so that you can customize it um, to what makes sense for you. So whatever I'm presenting in this section are, are, is kind of like a foundation. And then as you need to um, change things, tweak things, add things um, to make this kind of work for you. Um, so the first framework uh, section is here on page 41, and this is, again is just the steps that make the most sense in my brain about how to approach uh, designing service learning from community opportunity. Um, so when you're with your students, the first step that I would recommend is thinking about defining what community opportunity is to your students. Um, I really like the phrasing of community opportunity because it phrases that in the positive um, Kind of language, um, but this could be anything from an issue in community that was mentioned kind of like in the chat where maybe there's littering or um, graffiti, things like that. So something in the community that provides an opportunity to do a service learning project. Um, the other like key piece of information that I uh, really like to make sure students understand is what a stakeholder is and um, introducing who stakeholders could be in a community and brainstorming that. Um, from there, once they understand what community opportunity is and what stakeholders are, you can start brainstorming um, opportunities and things things that they've observed in their communities, whether that's within your classroom, your school grounds, or a neighborhood. Depending on where your students are at, is going to depend that uh, going to influence what that range is. But brainstorming some opportunities from your community. Then from there, deciding on which opportunity to focus on and with that specific opportunity, you can identify some stakeholders. Lots of brainstorming in this process, because uh, then I would imagine that the next step would be brainstorming solutions with your students. From there, um, I've had students uh, kind of limit it down to two or three preferred solutions. And from those, establishing goals and action steps, um, definitely identifying and communicating with your community partners that are um, that are stakeholders in uh, that that opportunity. Definitely the next step would just be to take action. Once you've identified the opportunity and the solution and the goals and action steps, go ahead and go through with it. Um, and then these last two are super important. And I find that they're the easiest to kind of overlook as we are all so busy and kind of looking towards the next um, thing that we're doing with our students, these last two are reflect on the process and reflect on the learning, um, and then sharing your success with others, whether that's sharing at a staff meeting with other teachers, um, what you learned and what successes your students uh, kind of experienced, definitely both of those will then um, kind of increase the impact of this whole experience. So again, this is just the process that makes the most sense to me. This is a process that I've used a lot in my teaching and um, hopefully it's helpful. And if it needs to be adjusted for your scenario, then um, go ahead and definitely feel free to do that. The next uh, couple pages are planning units. So again, just emphasizing that these can be tailored to your scenario and what makes sense. Um, these are kind of as they are set up um, really for classroom teachers that have goals and objectives and standards. And so we worked uh, a little bit with the language on these planning sheets. Um, this also might not like drive really well with your planning style, um, but really what the goal here is, is to uh, identify the key pieces of information that should be um, thought about and planned for in advance and um, allowing a place to collect all of that in one spot. So um, things like what the topic is, what subjects might be incorporated into that topic, um, the educational goals and objectives and standards, if that's applicable to your teaching, um, can go here. Um, we provided a section where you can really pull out and identify 
each of the place-based service learning principles and just really clearly outline how um, each of those play out in your uh, unit. Um, identifying your community opportunity and writing it there, as well as community partners that you and your students have brainstormed um, to work with providing a space for contact information for those community partners. And then um, lots of teachers work within like students will be able to or what skills and knowledge students will need in order to be successful um, in this experience. So we provided a spot to kind of plan through that part. And then specific examples of activities that you can use to facilitate the learning of skills and knowledge that students will need to be successful. So that'll make more sen sense in a moment, um, but this is just a section to make sure that within your unit, um, your activities are lining up to really support your, your students to be successful. And then the last little bit of the planning pages are just what action steps you might need to take in order to start your unit. Um, and then again, these last two stages of how are you going to facilitate reflection for your students and how will you share your stories of success and learning with others. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention, um, there is a whole session about reflection as well that is recorded and available to watch. Um, and so if you're stuck on like how, how to do really meaningful reflection, definitely check out that session. Um, that would be helpful for this page. So again, these are just um, planning pages. The other thing that's available in this unit are unit ideas, things from um, trail and park stewardship, educational signage, um, development of reading lists. Uh, my favorite idea that I've always wanted to see uh, live in action is an Iditarod showcase where students can prepare different presentations. Um, I just thought that that idea was was so cool. And um, the one last thing that I'll pull out here from unit ideas is the quest activity. Um, we've had a three part series on um, developing quests. So if that's something of interest that those sessions will be super helpful. Um, and then going on, we have actual down here, we have lesson plans. So these are independent lessons um, not a unit wide, but just one activity that will kind of help students be better prepared for um, the service learning. So whether that's learning uh, a bit about the history or a little bit about winter adaptations on the trail, um, these are these indiv individual activities. Um, so one thing that I will highlight, these are um, structured in a couple different ways. So We've got big ideas that are themes or focal points for unit or activity. Um, then we've got enduring understandings, understandings. These are presented in full sentence statements that represent what students will take away from the unit. Um, I kind of mentioned this earlier, students will be able to is the phrasing that a lot of classroom teachers are really familiar with. Um, we phrase them as enduring understandings, but those are kind of interchangeable. Um, and then essential questions will guide um, either the formative or summative assessments that you might design for your unit. And so these are questions that will be able to influence the activities that you choose. Um, they'll definitely be questions that students are um, addressing or learning about. So those are all listed within each of these units as well. Um, for our big ideas, we've got several that we highlighted that are really fundamental to teaching about the Iditarod as well as teaching about place-based service learning. And so the first big idea that we have is connection and time. The themes of connection um, are really evident around the Iditarod National Historic Trail. Um, and then time is super important as, as we've mentioned that history is not just limited to the past, but the history of this trail occurs today and will continue to occur in this state. So thinking about connection and time as a big idea. The other big ideas that we had were resilience and collaboration. These are themes that are really evident in the folks that have um, been really involved in the trail. And then the last big idea is stewardship um, and what stewardship means and how students and teachers can become stewards of the trail. So those are big ideas. Enduring understanding examples um, that we've provided. So again, those are like the students will be able to. These are full sentences of what students are walking away from. And so one example is that 
Trails are valuable to communities due to their role in connection to nature, to others, and to health. Um, so that's just one example. Um, teachers are encouraged to think of their own enduring understandings they would want uh, their students to take away from their unit and their activities. Um, and then we've got two types of essential questions that we provide. Um, the first one is convergent essential questions. Those are ones that um, have multiple answers, um, or no, these are ones that have one answer. So what are the unique characteristics of the Iditarod National Historic Trail is an example of a convergent essential question. And then we've got divergent questions, which are more open-ended and have no right or wrong answer. And those could be things like, what are some of the reasons that the INHT is important to your community? And that really encourages students to think really broadly and come up with lots of different answers. Um, I won't dive too deep into each of these lesson plans, um, but we've provided uh, four different examples here. Sorry to keep scrolling all over the place. So we've got history ones, um, science, like winter adaptation ones. We've got a math focused one and one that focuses on writing and reading with storytelling. And so um, the last thing that I'll just mention about the, the activities in here is that they're presented in um, something called the learning cycle that I um, adopted from the Beatles project. So um, the Beatles project is a great resource for like teaching outside and for place-based service learning. And so this cycle, this learning cycle is, is kind of foundational to all of these examples. Um, other things that are in this section are things called the hip pockets. Those are short, versatile activities that can be done with limited materials and limited times or limited time. Um, there are sessions um, of Take It Outside that deep dive into hip pocket activities as well. So I won't go over these too much, but those are in there as well as some nature journaling prompts. Um, again, there's nature journaling sessions um, that are fully recorded and deep dive into a lot of these activities. And so if you're interested in, in kind of walking through and some examples of these activities, definitely check those sessions out. Um, here we just have an example of a place-based service learning unit that was done by a third grade teacher in Unilaclete, actually a past ITREC teacher. And so um, we provided this unit example and highlighted the where the place-based service learning um, principles are present in it. And then kind of um, this reflection piece as well was super important. So that's all um, I have got for resources. Um, let me scroll back up really quickly here. So just to review, we've got the process for divining, designing service learning from Community Opportunity on page 41. And then pages 42 through 44 are these planning pages that can be adjusted for your needs. And then we've got unit ideas and activity examples in this section. Um, I'm noting the time and I don't want to take up too much longer. And so one thing that I would definitely encourage folks to do is to look at these resources um, in this section and start to piece together a unit or a lesson, whether that's taking something that you already teach and making adjustments for it to fit this, um, this kind of process or designing something new from scratch. Um, hopefully these resources are helpful in kind of supporting you in planning. And as always, just emphasizing that if you wanna take bits and pieces of it to really make it your own, um, that is the whole point is that we're empowering you as educators to, to design these experiences for you and your students. Um, was one last thing that I will point out about the educator resource guide is this checkpoint five. I'm not going to go over it too much, but these are the materials um, of things that go along with the activities. So if you're looking through those activity plans and you're like, oh, I mentioned um, the Iditarod map, this appendix is where those kind of resources that go along with the activities will be. Um, lastly, we've got a list of uh, a glossary of just different acronyms or agencies and agency information, all things that have been mentioned throughout the guide. And then finally, 
uh, a list of resources that folks can check out for more information, whether it's more historical information, um, whether you want to get to the Forest Service website and just check the information out there or try to connect with someone from the Forest Service. Um, these are all great resources here. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing or yeah, stop sharing now and open it up for any questions um, about those four sections. I know that was a lot of information really quickly, um, but as I mentioned, some of that information was uh, was kind of gone over in each of their own sessions in detail. So um, yeah, I'll go ahead and stop now. Are there any questions about the educator resource guide or how to use it? I have a question. <laughs> Go for it. Hi. Um, hi, Meredith. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like ridiculously late, but um, and I'm going to be honest, this is the first time that I've really, really spent time with this resource guide. Like I had looked through it before, but um, do you have any suggestions on adapting this knowledge and this rate to something even beyond? I know you use mm -hmm. Iditarod as its example, but it feels like it could also be applied to other things as well. And do you have suggestions on? Yeah, yeah. So uh, main things that I think about that can be applied to any topic are things like the hip pockets. Um, this, I'm trying to scroll back up. Oh, and I'm realizing I'm not even screen sharing, but the process that I outlined on page 41 from designing service learning from community opportunity um, that could, mm -hmm. in this example, is very tied to the Iditarod and things that can be done in relation to the Iditarod, but that process can be applied to um, kind of any community opportunity, whether it's um, a community park or, um, yeah, a, a student has like, a connection to an organization through volunteering or, or whatever that looks like, that one can be applicable to everything. Um, and then broadly, I think that, I mean, I think that most of it can be applied to anything. And that's the beautiful yeah. thing about place-based service learning is you can take these principles and be really focused on math or science and still achieve all six of these principles. So um, I'm having a hard time having like a solid answer because I think that the approach of place-based service learning is broad enough that it can be a foundation yeah. for any topic. Was that no, kind of what page, your question was? Yeah, page 41, check. Thank 41, you. <laughs> yeah. Page 33 and 41, those would be the ones that I would highlight. And something came in on the chat. Oh my gosh, yeah, yes. Um, I don't, not super familiar with um, resources for kiddos, but for teachers, let me find the page here so I can actually say the names right for teachers. Um, there, oh, I don't have the names listed. I have a bunch of links listed. Um, there are a lot of resources through the Iditarod Historic Trail Alliance. That's where I would um, guide you to first. There's books through the Alliance website and store um, that are really great to check out either about the race or um, the trail itself. So I know that's not as clear of an answer as I would like to give you, um, but that's that would be the first place that I would point you to, Sophie, is, is the Iditarod Historic Trail Alliance website. Perfect, thank you. I see your resources, like the back page. I see all the amazing websites. So I feel really good in this end and you did a great job citing all of the place-based books. I'm like excited to dive into those professional development books, but I was just curious if there's any books that really stuck out to you, but it sounds like that will be a good place to start my research. Yeah, definitely start on the website. I will say for my research in developing this guide, 99% uh, of it was through interviews actually. So um, if you can get connected with folks that are connected to the trail, so through any of the facilitators um, for Take It Outside, um, we could connect you with folks who have just, yeah, beyond wealths of knowledge. Um, and I, I found that that was super helpful was just talking to folks who have been connected to the trail for years, so. Um, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. 
Yeah, of course. Um, so I'll say um, just before like really finishing up here today, the um, educator resource guide is still in the process of getting kind of professionally designed and printed and being made available through those ways it'll be made available online um, once that happens. But for folks who um, would like access to it, we can send a PDF of it, which um, I think both folks here today are have access to that. So um, reach out if you would like access to the educator resource guide and we'll keep you updated on when it's kind of fully formally published. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining uh, this afternoon and I will uh, pass it back off to Delia. Olivia, thank you so much. That was just wonderful. It was as expected, really wonderful, good information for everybody. And thank you everybody for coming this afternoon. Um, we've got a few more uh, coming up that'll build on the good work that Olivia was just sharing. On March 24th, we're going to learn about outdoor classrooms focused on Wolverine Park. On March 31st, nature art. On April 5th, outdoor classrooms focused on Sand Lake and on April 21st, Science Along the Trail. So we're looking forward to seeing you at future events. And Olivia, fantastic. Thank you so much. And it's great to be working with you again. Bye-bye.